Wow, so here we are. Yeah, right on time. Here we are at session seven. We have made it all the way through um, to the very last of the sacraments that we're going to talk about as part of this study um, that we've been doing since, uh, really since right after Bishop Doyle's visit in January. We've been taking each week and uh, talking about each one of the sacraments We've been learning about each one, but the main thrust of this study has been not about kind of historical information on the sacraments or sort of what different um, parts of the Christian um, family think about each one, although we've touched on some of that. But really, this study has been focused predominantly on how each of the sacraments is an opportunity for us to encounter God as a means of grace and how actually all of them invite us into a grace-filled life. And we've talked about how uh, when God uh, bestows blessing upon somebody, you see this throughout scripture, and we also see this, I hope, evident in our own lives. When God bestows blessing upon somebody, God never bestows blessing so that you can just hold on to it and keep it and hoard it. Uh, God always bestows blessing so that it can go and create more blessing, right? And, uh, and that's another way in which the sacraments function, and, and hence uh, the name of this class, Walking sacraments, uh, that we are all called uh, to be outward and visible signs of God's grace in the world. We're supposed to be little walking sacraments out in the world. And this was, of course, as we've discussed before, a line from a sermon preached by a guy named Austin Ferrer, um, and he preached it about um, the ordination of priests, uh, and he referred to priests this way. But as I've said every single week, and I'll say one more time today, uh, Priests are not the only ones who can be walking sacraments, right? By virtue of our baptism, we all have this choice each and every day. Uh, we wake up and, uh, you know, I don't sit there and consciously think, am I going to be an outward and visible sign of God's grace today? But I hope by the end of this class, we all will do that uh, as we head into the season of Lent. So I'm excited to uh, today to talk about this seventh sacrament. So we've talked about baptism uh, first and, and Eucharist. Those were the first two weeks, and we talked about how those two sacraments are special, right? Those are the two gospel sacraments, or uh, the fancy word is dominical sacraments, from the Latin word dominus, or Lord. And these were the two sacraments that were given to us by Jesus in the gospels, right? We see Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan, and then, of course, I mean, the Eucharist, right? He literally gives us the Last Supper. Um, and so... We talked about both of those, and our salvation is bound up in those sacraments in a unique way, uh, but there are five other things that we call sacramental actions that the church acknowledges as additional means of grace. They are also places where we encounter God's grace uh, in the life of the church, and those things are ordination. We talked about how everybody has a ministry, confirmation about the sort of passing on of apostolic ministry and um, taking ownership of one's baptism in that way. We talked about marriage as a means of grace and about how uh, our definition of, of sacrifice in relationships uh, is very, well, sacrifice in general is very, very skewed culturally, but to understand uh, that meaning or the true meaning of that word as to make something holy and to set it apart, um, when we think about the ways that our relationships and marriage in particular um, help us to do that uh, as a means of grace and, and learn how to love like God loves us. Um, that's, uh, that is, is a way that we encounter God in the life of the church. And then last week, we talked about confession, didn't we? We talked about confession, or known by its longer name, the reconciliation of a penitent. Uh, and we talked about how um, even though this is basically, I mean, to, to repent and seek forgiveness for your sins is literally like just a basic definition of what we do as Christians. Uh, despite that, very few Episcopalians really avail themselves of the opportunity to, um, to engage in sacramental confession. And I even confessed uh, to all of you that I, I haven't ever actually really done that um, in a formal way. Uh, but that, that's probably something that I should do and need to change because it is a sacrament where God's grace and forgiveness is made sort of real to us in a very powerful and tangible way. And we heard some stories last week from some folks who were uh, here in this, in this room who grew up 
um, or were for a time um, Roman Catholic. And of course, uh, in the Catholic Church, this is a really big thing. You, you confess regularly uh, to a priest. And uh, when done well and in a healthy way, um, the people shared their stories about how that was really just incredibly powerful. Uh, to be able to tell something to someone that you otherwise would think would just, you're ashamed of it, and so you think that by telling it to someone, they would react in judgment. But to have them actually not react in judgment at all, but to pronounce forgiveness, is just a very powerful and tangible way of experiencing the very same way that God looks at us, right? Um, we feel ashamed before God, but God says no. I, I, I love you, it's fine, you know, um, you're forgiven. And, uh, and that can be an incredible means of grace. Uh, and one that's especially appropriate to think about as we do stand right on the doorway of Lent. Uh, because beginning on this Wednesday, we're going to embark on a season that's all about um, confession and repentance and continuing to turn back towards God. And we also talked a little bit uh, last week about... Um, I mean, okay, so if we're talking about confessing, what are you confessing, right? Uh, and we talked about what sin is and a definition of sin. The word sin literally means to miss the mark. And so we talked about how sin is really just when we want to go our own way, right, as opposed to going God's way. And repentance is literally to turn back, to turn our, uh, our attention and our focus back on God. And um, even though, you know, typically those two words, sin and repentance, uh, have sort of this fire and brimstone kind of association, sin can actually be a lot of really boring stuff. It doesn't have to be uh, something, uh, you know, really juicy and, and, and big, like embezzling money or, you know, I don't know, murdering somebody, right? Like, um, it doesn't have to be that. Uh, in fact, actually, like pretty much most of the time it's not, right? When we talk about sin in our lives, it really it isn't those kind of big things sometimes. It's the, it's the small things we do. It's the thinking that we can make it under our own steam, right? It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the disagreements that we have with those we love or maybe the resentments that we carry. Or maybe, again, it's the things that um, maybe someone has actually done to us and we just can't seem to let go of it. Uh, last week, uh, after this class, actually, Duke uh, Dutil gave me a really uh, great little saying um, that, uh, you know, it's like, um, uh, I think it was, oh man, I'm going to forget it. Of course, now he's not in this room to repeat it for me. Uh, but it was a really lovely piece of wisdom that had been shared with him about uh, resentment being you drinking a poison expecting the other person to die. And that that's, you know what I mean? And then that's, that's kind of what sin is like in our lives sometimes, right? It's, it's like we're drinking a poison, but we're expecting the other person to die from it. And, uh, and confession is a way of, of, it's an antidote to that. It's a way to, to give that up, um, to give that back to God, to, to lift that burden, and to experience, uh, as we talked about, liberty, freedom um, from those things that weigh us down. Um, so, okay, so that's what we talked about last week. And now we come to the final one on this, on this graphic. We are at unction, yes, unction, uh, or the anointing of the sick. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about unction. And then I am also going to, at the end of this, try to sort of wrap all of these together and bring this whole study uh, together into a close. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, okay, so unction. What, what, is, what is unction? Unction is a, is a funny word. We talked about that in the first week. You never hear someone casually use it. You know, um, there, are other, there are some churchy terms that get kind of used in other ways, word outside of the church. And even in the church, we don't often say unction. We will say anointing, because that's a word we use a lot more. Um, but what is unction? Um, well, unction uh, really is just, uh, it, it's a synonym for anointing with oil. That's really all it is. Um, so, and, and is used not just uh, in Christian churches and denominations, but sort of like we talked about with baptism and things like that. Um, the roots of it go back even further and kind of cross 
different cultural and even religious boundaries. Uh, anointing of the sick in particular has been a customary practice in a lot of different civilizations throughout history, including the ancient Greeks, uh, and certainly early Jewish communities uh, did the same. It's been something that humanity has felt this kind of impulse to do for a very, very, very long time, that when you were sick, you needed to be anointed with oil. Um, and, you know, and at various points, it was believed that the oil itself imbued healing properties and things like that. But this has been something that uh, this anointing with oil has had this association with, with healing and curing for a very, very, very long time. Um, anointing also has another association, which we did talk about when we talked about baptism, which is that anointing is also what you do to uh, like coronate somebody, right? Like royalty is anointed uh, with oil uh, when they ascend to their seat of power. And it also has had that association for a very, very long time as well. You read about that all through the Old Testament, right? It's, it pops up in the Psalms about um, being anointed with oil uh, and the oil runs down into your beard. And when I say anointed, I mean, it's not like what we do with this like little boop, with the oil, it's like they would take a, you know, a, a flagon of this stuff and pour it over you, okay? I mean, that was what it was. It's a very, very, like imagine if that's what we did. Um, I would be in big trouble if, <laughs> if uh, you know, if imagine after a baptism, a, a priest doused the baby all in oil, um, the mother would be scandalized and that baptismal garment would be, who? I would be, I'd be run out of the church. There'd be angry grandmas everywhere. Can you believe what this priest did? Um, but that's how it was. They, used to, they would take big jars of oil. Um, and because, of course, oil was costly as well. It was, it was a costly thing. Um, the, to make oil is not easy. You have to press whatever it is that you're using, whether there's olives or whatever. It's a time-consuming process. And so, um, and so this was a... Uh, yeah, so it's always had this association as well of... of um, uh, not just, you know, you would use it on the sick, but also for uh, any kind of uh, festive occasion like a coronation or something like that. Um, and it was seen, even before its use in the Christian church, it was seen as having this kind of sacramental quality to it, that it, when you were anointed, you were being set apart. I mean, that's what, what's what that means. So to kind of take it back to um, the, you know, the discussion of sacrifice, for something to be sacrificed, for something to be set apart, um, something that was sacrificed was often also anointed um, before it was offered up or whatever happened to it, happened to it. Um, and yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. David was... Yes. Da yeah, David was anointed. Well, and that's the thing is that it is. It's a big, it, it's a big thing. You're not going to be subtly anointed. You know what I mean? It's not going to be like he was, you know, nobody, like you said, everybody would have noticed. It's the youngest, right? But to have oil poured on you and to be, you know, and have hands laid on you and, and to be prayed over. And, I mean, that's, that was a, a, a big, that's a big thing. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, actually, th there is a, Another etymological thing that I think is important to note is uh, the word Christ. We say it all the time, right after the word Jesus, or right before the word Jesus, but what, what does the word Christ actually mean? It's not, it's not his name, right? It's not, it's not Jesus' last name, that's always it. But what does it mean? Hmm? It actually means anointed. Well, holy, yeah, I mean, that's... Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the word Christ is the anointed one. Uh, that's, that's what it means. So there, there were, um, in the ancient world, a number of figures for whom that, uh, that descriptor was ascribed. So, for instance, um, Caesar was referred to as the Christus, the anointed one. Um, but when we say that Jesus is the Christ with a capital C... We are making a, a theological claim about the fact that, no, actually, Jesus is, it's kind of like when we capitalize the Son of God. Of course, we are all children of God, but Jesus is the capital S, Son of God, right? Um, and so Jesus is the 
capital C, Christ. He is the anointed one, the one that is sent uh, to save us from our sins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so and that'll tie in here in a second. Okay, so that's, that's what unction is, is anointing with oil, and it's something that had these same associations for a very, very long time as well. Uh, now, it's important to differentiate the anointing of the sick, which is what this sacrament is, from some other times when we also anoint people with oil. I've already mentioned the one at baptism. That's the biggest one. Uh, right after we baptize a baby, the baby's handed off, and uh, one of the clergy will stick their thumb into a thing of oil, will anoint the baby and say, you are anointed with the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever, right? Um, sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. That is not this. Okay, so that anointing is not unction, uh, because presumably the baby is not sick, right? You're not doing it, but, but, the, but that anointing is actually, um, that is uh, when the, the baby is, uh, that's chrism oil. Um, uh, that's not the same thing. That's been blessed by a bishop, and it's, anyway, it's, that's, that's different than, than unction. Um, ordination is the same way. Sometimes you'll be anointed with oil at ordination. That's also not unction although maybe it should be, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, but no, it's, uh, that's, that's not it as well. This is, this is specific, okay? Unction is specifically oil that has been blessed uh, to anoint the sick. Yes, Julie. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. This is different. Now, sometimes this could also, be, I mean, this can also be blessed by a bishop. There are um, places where the, the oil that's used at, um, well, well, we'll get to this in a little bit when I talk specifically about, about kind of how it works in the Roman Catholic Church, because um, a, lot of, a lot of Episcopal dioceses will follow that convention. But, um, but chrism must be blessed by a bishop. Holy oil can just be blessed by a priest um, that's used for this, although um, you would typically still have it blessed by a bishop anyway, um, as I believe we do uh, here. I think do make sure that every time the bishop visits, there's a whole bunch of oil that gets blessed in the back. Um, the, uh, the way, well, I'll kind of skip ahead a little bit because this, this makes sense uh, to do now. So there's, a, in a number of places, I mean, I've served in some dioceses that did it, that did it this way, um, there would be a um, there'd be a time in the year, usually uh, around Holy Week, uh, where the whole, all of the priests in the diocese would gather together um, for a kind of renewal of their priestly vows, uh, and they would celebrate communion together. And at that service, the bishop who would preside over the service would also bless a bunch of oil that then the clergy would take back to their parishes for the year. Um, and so that's, and that still is the convention in many places. It's not the convention um, here in Texas. We just, uh, yesterday evening, I got back from diocesan council, and there was an announcement made at council that if you desired to go pick up some oil that had been blessed, one could do so over in like room 2B or whatever. <laughs> um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, part of the uh, part of our worship or anything in the same way that it, it is in, in some other dioceses that sort of um, hew more closely to the Roman Catholic custom of doing it. Um, but anyway, so, so yeah. But it is, it is different oil. And in fact, actually in seminary, they made a really big deal about this. You don't want to anoint someone with the chrism oil because they've already been baptized and it's different. And it's, anyway, it was like a whole, it was a whole thing. I probably shouldn't say this because this is recorded, but I kind of think it's oil that was blessed. It's oil that was blessed. I mean, I, I hope my liturgics professor never hears this. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so they can. That's a, that's a good point. So there is a tradition. So, of course, right, okay, if you have these two oils, right, you've got chrism oil and you've got the kind of your, your standard unction oil, um, there has arisen a practice of really like heavily uh, spicing the 
the oils differently so that you, they smell differently. So the chrism oil, you're right. Usually it's got, got spices in it. It has a, and then sometimes uh, the other oil, they'll put like rosemary and stuff in so it gives it this kind of nice scent to it. Because um, to be fair, if you're using it over a long period of time, olive, it's, it's just olive oil. I mean, olive oil is what we use. You use the purest kind of olive oil you can find. Um, but of course, if you have olive oil in your kitchen, you know after a while it's, you know, it starts to, uh, goes off just a little bit, you know, starts to smell a little sour. And so, yeah, you'd put things in it to keep it kind of perfumed and lovely and nice. Um, though there are some places that, that don't do that because people can be allergic to the things that you put in it, and then you put it on their heads, and then you don't want to give them this, you know, you don't want to have a red, like this blazing red cross on your forehead and have to take Benadryl after. But, um, but it's still very common, and I, and I, I like it to have a little, um, a little you know, yeah. scent to it. Um, Duke puts rosemary in ours um, to kind of give it that so that you, when you open it and when you put it on your head. Because again, the sacraments, we talk about this um, throughout this class, right? About how the sacraments are these tangible things, right? They're these tangible signs of God's heavenly kingdom. And so I kind of think actually the scent is nice because it should be this really sensory experience every time you, in, you know, whatever sacrament it is, you're, you're, it needs to be this really sensory experience. Yes? Very much the science, but there was a medical study done about years ago that proves that rosemary scent, well, the oil, basically renews your mind. Oh, there we go. I like this, that rosemary... Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, I'll have to tell Duke that. He probably already knows, but that's, yes. Yeah, so that rosemary, the scent of rosemary, the oil renews your mind. That is good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. I think you've got to put some scent in there because otherwise, it's, again, it's just olive oil, right? Um, and this is. Ugh. So my my liturgics professor did have a uh, a little mantra that I repeat often when I think about worship planning, and it was maximize your sign value, um, because again, these are tangible sort of sensory experiences. Um, that are meant to draw us into, uh, draw us close to God. We experience God in these different ways, right, as we've been talking about. And so his whole thing was maximize your sign value. If you're, a, if you're a priest, because of course we're all in seminary, this is when he said this, you know, if you're a priest and you're doing all these weird things with your hands over the elements at, at communion, but they're small and only you're doing them and no one can really see what they are, what does that what does that mean? You know what I mean? You're not maximizing your sign value because it's 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 not for you in the congregation. If I'm sitting over there muttering my own prayers to the chalice or whatever, um, that 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 doesn't communicate the you know. Similarly with baptism, right? If you if you only you know if you pour just like some churches just like a teeny little bit of water in the font, it's just like you know uh, that well. Here we are praying about the, you know, G, you know, God parting the Red Sea and all of this sort of stuff. And then over here, you know, just this little trickle of water into the font. So you want like a big flagon of water and you want it to really, you know, you want to make a lot of sound with it as it goes into the basin. That's why I actually I love that we've got this big metal bowl, actually, because it makes this really good sound, you know, and people can hear it. You can hear the water being poured. It's not just, you know. Um, and so, yes, maximize the sign value. And so I think the scent is kind of the same way, right? It, it's one of those things that helps kind of draw you into the otherworldliness of what's going on. And so, okay, so that's, so that's a different oil. P point being, that is not this oil um, that we're talking about with the anointing of the sick. Um, there's also a, uh, a kind of... Um, what would be the right word? It's not a misnomer because it's not misnamed. That's not quite the word I'm looking for, but maybe misunderstanding uh, about this. People often equate this with last rites. They think that this is about uh, death or what you do before someone dies. And that's not quite 
Not quite true. So that is, um, last rites uh, are actually a series of things, hence the plural there, rites, right? It's not just one thing. And last rites does include anointing with oil, but it also often includes making a, a sort of a last sort of deathbed confession or, um, or celebrating communion for the last time and that kind of thing. So it's, it's actually a set of things that are the last rites. It's not just the oil. And um, you actually anoint people all the time who, thank the Lord, aren't on their deathbed, right? I, I do this all the time to people who aren't, aren't dying. Um, I mean, I guess in some sense we all are marching towards the grave. But, um, but it, that's called extreme unction when you do it like right before death, okay? It's not, this isn't the, the last thing you do before somebody dies exclusively. Um, you could be getting ready to go in for surgery, right, or whatever. And, uh, you know, we'd come pray for you and anoint you with oil. And this would be what we're doing. That's unction. That's this. Okay, um, but, but I've, I've noticed that just popularly in the life of the church, it, it sort of starts to become equated with only that thing you do right before you die. <laughs> okay, but, but that's not actually unction. Unction is just anointing of the sick. It could happen anytime, uh, anytime you're sick. And in fact, um, we had at my former parish, and I know that we've had this here in various permutations, and we're, we're going to hopefully bring this back um, soon. We've been talking about it for a little while. Um, you know, having like a midweek Eucharist where you offer anointing with oil for healing um, at the communion rail. Um, we did that every Wednesday at St. Luke's. We would do it. Um, and it was a time where folks, again, sometimes who wouldn't even, didn't have physical infirmities necessarily that they were coming to, to pray for and be anointed for. But it was sometimes it was... Um, you know, uh, it, was a, it was more of a, a burden that they carried. It was almost like confession, you know what I mean? That's the kind of healing that they were seeking. It wasn't, you know, oh, I've, I've, you know, I, I broke my arm and I've got to have surgery. Would you uh, anoint me before surgery? It was also, you know, um, I'm estranged from my daughter and she recently reached out to me or something like that. I mean, that was the kind of thing. So, um, Anyway, so anointing with oil, it, it is not, that, that's a long, long way of saying it is not exclusively the thing that you do when somebody's on their deathbed, okay? Uh, but it sometimes get, gets conflated with that because, uh, anyway, okay. So let me see. I do technically have notes here, and as always, we know how well that works. We know, we know my relationship with my notes is, is always a struggle. Um, da, 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 okay. All right, I've already talked about last rites. Okay, so let's talk a little bit uh, briefly about the biblical text that we kind of, where we find this um, in Scripture. And the main one is in the book of James, in James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, uh, where James writes, Is any among you sick? He asks. Well, let him call for the elders of the church, and let the elders pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Okay, that's in James chapter 5. And that's, um, again, like I, I said, I mean, James is writing in the very, very, very earliest, earliest days of the church. But presumably, you can read backwards from here and infer that this was a practice that they were doing even then, right? That, um, that this was part of what the community of the faithful, the church, was supposed to be about. If you were sick or someone was in need, this was something you needed to do. Well, you know, call for the elder of the church, the, the word there, presbyter, the, the priest. Call for the elder in the church that will pray for you and anoint you with oil. Um, and so anyway, so that this is, this is there. There's also a couple of other uh, passages in the Gospels that are uh, kind of trotted out around this idea of uh, for biblical precedent for uh, for this sacrament. But it's very clear that it was important in the life of the early church, and, uh, and we see this most like explicitly in that verse from James. So, okay, let's see. Again, I've gotten a little ahead of myself here, because we already talked a little bit about the Catholic Church, and um, so, okay, so there, there are some we talk about how each sacrament, right, has, has two pieces. The outward and visible sign piece and 
Yep, and the inward and spiritual grace piece, right? And so the outward and visible sign here is pretty obvious, right? It's the oil, just like, you know, you have the water and baptism, et cetera, et cetera. But the inward and spiritual grace part, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so the inward and spiritual grace part, actually a lot of these, uh, and this, this comes more from Roman Catholic teaching, but I actually think it's, uh, it's, it's very applicable, um, it, are very similar to baptism in a lot of ways. So um, one of the, the kind of graces that is conferred, one of the ways that we encounter God in the, um, uh, when we anoint someone and pray for them, is that there's this uniting of the sick person or the person who's in need. What it, we'll, we'll define sick not just medically speaking, but like whatever is, is ailing them, uh, whatever is causing them to seek out this sacrament. Um, there's a uniting of that person in their grief or suffering with the grief and suffering of Christ, right? This idea that just like in baptism, we are, we are united with Jesus in his death and united with him again in his resurrection, as Paul reminds us, um, so too in this sacrament are we united with Christ in his suffering. We're, we are reminded powerfully in this sacrament that we don't serve a God that doesn't know what it's like to feel pain. And you know, as Christians, I think, especially as we're heading into the season where we're, we're anticipating Easter, uh, we can sometimes lose sight of how, like, really just crazy a notion that is. You know, how incredible a notion it is that the God of the universe has experienced pain and suffering like we experience pain and suffering. Um, I once had a conversation with a good friend of mine uh, in college. We were roommates, and he um, he had grown up Mormon. He was uh, at that time, uh, and and is still um, a, an atheist. He's a secular humanist, um, and uh, and one of my greatest friends. I absolutely love him so much. And we would get in these conversations. Um, He's a deeply caring and compassionate person, and so they were never, we could have, you, you know those people, they're, they're very rare, but they're those people in your life who you can have these incredibly enriching uh, disagreements with that are not arguments, you know what I mean? They're like explorations, because you are, you're talking as, as like two people who mutually care for one another, right? And so, and he, he is that person for me. And he, he was talking about how one of his problems philosophically with, uh, with religion in general, but certainly with, uh, with Christianity was, um, was the idea of the problem of evil and suffering, right? How can a good God let bad things happen, et cetera, et cetera. And as we were talking about, which is a very valid thing, it's a big question that um, I don't know about you, but I think pretty much everybody wonders from time to time, especially when we're going through it. You know what I mean? We, we often wonder, where is God? God, why are you letting this happen to me, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, he kind of laid out this scenario about, you know, I just can't get over, like, if you, if you, like, just suppose you had, you know, you were God, and you were all-knowing, you were all-powerful, all that sort of stuff, right? And you're, you're sitting up there in heaven, and you've got this red button. And at any point, you could press that red button and end suffering for people on earth, and you choose not to do it. Doesn't that make you bad, right? Like, it does, you know? And I said, yeah, actually, if that's how it was, it would, right? Like, but, but part of, part of the thing for us as Christians is that actually that's not the scenario that we profess. The scenario that we profess is not a God who like has the button and could end it at any time and chooses not to. It's the God who actually kind of came down and, and entered into the mess of it and suffered pain too. He experienced the suffering that we have. And for me, that absolutely changes the game in a, in a pretty significant way. And so this is one of those sacraments where we are reminded profoundly, I think, of how we are not only how, how God cares for us, but how God was in solidarity and is in solidarity with us in our suffering. And I think that's one of the graces that we experience there. Um, and so because of that, because of that solidarity in our suffering, we also experience in this sacrament um, the, the sort of um, strength and will to persevere, to push forward, even when it's really, really hard. The courage that we need to endure in the midst of pain and suffering. Um, we, all of that is wrapped up in this to me. 
Um, you know, and then there's also kind of some understandings about, uh, you know, this as, as being another reminder of the forgiveness of our sins. It's a way that absolution is pro proclaimed over us uh, in these moments, and, and thus the restoration kind of of our souls to God. Remember, this is a very Roman Catholic understanding. But yes, yeah, Julie. Yes, so there, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why, why olive oil is a good question. So I love what you just said about the association with the olive branch and peace and how when you are anointed with the oil, which is olive oil, there is this association of, of peace and um, in finding peace in, in God and in the sacrament. Um, I think that's very true. Now, there, there are a lot of, I mean, the main reason for why olive oil is because that's the, that was the oil, right? That's the oil that they, they had um, in the Mediterranean world. And uh, it was the most accessible oil to them in many ways. Um, it was plentiful. And, uh, but I also think there's um, kind of like with, with communion, what, right, that part of what we are offering up, so at the offertory, right, it's not just that we collect the money then, but it's also the offertory actually refers to the bringing up of the, the bread and the wine up to the altar. And there is an acknowledgement in that action that what we are doing is um, bread is something that is, is, a, is, is produced of the earth, right? We have to we have to farm it. We have to harvest the wheat. We've got to crush it up and make the flour. And we've got to, you know what I mean? And, and it's, it's this like from God's bounty. Same thing with the wine, right? It's grapes and you have to, you know, you have to, to make it. Um, and similarly, olive oil doesn't just come out. It's not like tree sap, you know, where you, you tap the tree and then all of a sudden the olive oil pours forth or something. You, you have to, again, you've got to harvest the olives. You've got to make, anyway. And so I do think... Um, there's this acknowledgement too, and it's uh, that it is it is part of of God's provision for us um, as well. But I love that that yes, the the olive branch is a sign of peace as well. And so there's I think that's in here too. They do. They have to be pressed. Yes. Yep. They have to be. They have to be put under pressure, literally, and it takes time to make them. There's a lot of there's a lot of of, uh, of layers of meaning in that, um, which is one of the things that I love most about the sacraments. Is none of these have I mean have y'all noticed that right? Like none of these have just like one superficial meaning. You know, none of these are things that I can just stand up here and say. Communion means this, and then we can all be done for the day, right? They're, they're layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of, of richness and meaning and resonance. I mean, in, in many ways, the sacraments are um, very much like parables, right? We studied the parables uh, early in the fall, and we talked about how those, there, there is no simple pat uh, kind of takeaway from each parable, but rather each parable invites you deeper uh, into exploring the mystery of the kingdom of God. And that's why, partially why I say that the sacraments are an invitation into a grace-filled life is because they too draw us deeper and deeper and deeper uh, into the reality of God. And um, so, yeah, so there's, there's a lot we could unpack with just the symbolism of uh, something needing to be pressed and it bringing forth healing and all that sort of stuff. Um, okay, so... Um, Oh, we're still good on time. Okay. So I, I really like that. I like that you brought that up. Um, so, uh, so everything that I've been saying um, is, is true about the sacrament and true about how we understand it. But I, I want to um, uh, take just a little sidebar and talk about uh, this sacrament in Anglicanism specifically. Um, so in the first book of Common Prayer, because this ties back to kind of what we talked about in Advent with our class on the distinctives of the Anglican tradition and, and of how we, how we came to be as Episcopalians and, and about the history of the prayer book and all that sort of stuff. Um, and in the original prayer book that Thomas Cranmer, if you all remember him and his, his big beard that he had in the painting, um, so Thomas Cranmer, the, the first prayer book, uh, as, as you may remember, was almost just pretty much a translation of the Roman Missal, right? 
um, into English. And so because of that, it included the anointing of oil with, uh, of, uh, the anointing of the sick with oil in it. Um, but then a couple of later editions of the prayer book omitted the, uh, the oil. So they kept in the visitation uh, and, and prayer, the visitation of the sick and prayers for the sick, but they took the oil out. Um, but over time, the oil made its way back in, and now <laughs> every other uh, sort of church in the Anglican tradition who has a new prayer book, um, the oil's back in there. So the oil's in our prayer book. It's, in, um, it's even in, so the Church of England, the official prayer book is still the 1662, but all of the, uh, they have a thing called common worship um, that's kind of like our right to service and, uh, that most churches use. And, um, and there is provision for anointing people with oil. Um, because again, maximize your sign value. Uh, if you're going to pray for somebody, that's wonderful. But why not just, you know, just put the oil in there too. Um, and so, uh, so again, like most things in our, our tradition, uh, we acknowledge it as, as a means of grace, as a way that you can encounter God. But it's not, it's not considered of the same order as baptism and Eucharist. Right? Okay. Let's see. So, now, we have journeyed far. We have journeyed through all seven of these sacraments, as I said, as we kind of bring this study to a close. And I think it is really fitting that we end with unction, because I believe that unction serves as a good image for us to ponder, as we've talked about for a lot of reasons and a good challenge for us to take up. Because lying at the heart of this, right, I've tried each week to provide some sort of question for us to stew over in the week ahead, something to kind of get us thinking about how each of these may change our, our daily life. So, you know, uh, from baptism, which was all about what would, it, you know, what would it look like for you to remind yourself every day that the most important thing about you is that you're beloved of God. Uh, you know, we talked about with... Um, with uh, confirmation about how we reaffirm our baptismal covenant. We say, uh, you know, I will do these things with God's help. And so what would it look like to truly live as if we believed God was with us in the midst of our lives and that we didn't have to do it by ourselves and et cetera, et cetera, right? What would it look like last week we, when we talked about confession? What would it look like to be, um, to live in that sense of liberation and freedom from those things um, that burden us and weigh us down, the things that, uh, that keep us from living in the, into the freedom and life uh, that God has intended for us. And so I think that the question here then is how might we bring healing and care not only into our own lives, but uh, elsewhere too? What would it look like to be a presence of healing and peace, right? To extend that olive branch that, that sense of mercy in our home, in our workplaces, wherever we may be, uh, day in and day out. What would it look like for us to be uh, reminded and to remind others that God isn't indifferent to our suffering, but was actually in it and is in it with us? I mean, that's, that's a radically different way of living than the way that I think sometimes popularly we see it where we shake our fists at God. And to be fair, if you read the Psalms, that's a very valid <laughs> thing to do sometimes. God can take it. It's okay, right? Uh, God, God can take our frustration and our anger. And sometimes we do just need to stand there and yell at him for a little while. But that doesn't mean that he's not there right in the midst of it with us. And I think being reminded of that and living into that and inviting others into that is a profound and powerful thing. And, and I think in some ways, unction kind of ties this off in a nice little bow for us because that is, of course, how each of the sacraments operates in its own way. So throughout this study, I've mentioned our little catechism that's in the back of the prayer book. Um, and I want to mention it again today in concluding this study. In one of the sections of the catechism, uh, there is a section that talks about the mission of the church. And it asks, what is the mission of the church? And it gives this very succinct definition. 
much more succinct than any committee. I always think it's, it's um, you know, you go to any Episcopal Church's website, including our own, and you will find there somewhere a kind of like, you know, vision or what we believe or like a, you know, mission statement thing. And you'll click it and it'll be this like paragraphs long thing that you can tell was clearly come up by a committee because each sentence seems like it was come up with by somebody else who had to have their thing in there. You know what I mean? It's very long and clunky and whatever. And here it is. The prayer book actually gives us a mission statement right here. And it's, it's one simple sentence. It says, the mission of the church, the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. That that's the mission of the church. That's what we are sent to out, literally what the word mission means, right? Sent out to do. Yes. Yes, I, I was just about to do that. Yes, the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ, right? To restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. That is what we are called to do and sent out to do. At its most basic, right? And that looks like a lot of different things in practice. But at its heart, that is what we are called to do, to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. Now, the Catechism goes on to ask a follow-up to that, <laughs> which is, through whom does the church carry out its mission? Through whom does the church carry out its mission? So, okay, that's maybe nice that the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. But who's doing that? Who's doing that? Who, who's, who's sent out to do it? Well, the catechism uh, tells us. The church carries out its mission, it says, through the ministry of all its members. Yes, us. Yes, all its members all of its members. That's who carries out the mission of the church, all of its members. As I said from the very beginning, and especially when we talked about ordination, every single baptized Christian has been given gifts to use in service of God's kingdom. And those gifts being used in service of God's kingdom is the mission of the, or is the ministry of the church. That it's not me and Mother Kelly that do ministry and then y'all kind of like thank us for our service or something. <laughs> we have a particular role and part to play. We hopefully help encourage you. We hopefully help equip you to do this, this work. Hopefully we, you know, we, we administer the sacraments. That's a part of what we do. But the ministry of the church is not done by clergy and then everybody else watches. The ministry of the church is done by all of us, all of the church's members. And each and every one of these sacraments that we have discussed throughout this study is not only the fuel that we need to accomplish this, it's not only the sustenance and the nourishment and all of that that we need to do that work, it's also the invitation into it, the invitation into that work. Now, okay, I'm going to um, mention this actually in my sermon for today. Uh, but sacraments, right, and I hope you've noticed this as well. Sacraments are all extremely ordinary things, right? Every single one of these is like an ordinary. If, like if you look at the outward and visible sign part, they're all extremely ordinary. Baptism is water. You know what I mean? There's almost nothing kind of more basic than water. Uh, communion, bread and wine. And sometimes, like I mentioned, we're sort of not convinced that the wafer is even bread, right? <laughs> um, ordination, it's just somebody putting their hands on your head. Marriage, just some promises and a party. You know what I mean? All of these things, unction, it's just olive oil, right? All of these things are extremely ordinary things. But here's the thing, right, is they're extremely ordinary things that are made extraordinary through the power of the Holy Spirit in our prayers. The waters of baptism are absolutely not ordinary, are they? It may just be water, 
But through the power of the Holy Spirit in our prayers, actually, as, and this is what I mentioned in today's sermon, so spoiler alert, but they become, the waters of baptism become the doorway to our salvation, right? And similarly, like today, we talked about unction, and unction may just be olive oil, but through prayer, actually, it becomes solidarity with Jesus and his suffering. It becomes a way for us to know and feel and touch and experience God's peace in our lives. Part of the beauty of the sacraments is that they are so absolutely ordinary, which is, I think, part of what you see when you really stop to think about what they are, is that God's present in all of the ordinary things, right? That the, uh, the, the earth is, as the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins says, is shot through with the glory of God. I love it. I love it. So we do really encounter God in particular in these seven ways, and, and, the, and, and baptism and Eucharist in really, really particular, right? Um, these are places, uh, I, I, one of my friends recently framed it this way, actually, talked about how um, in, in, she was talking specifically about the Eucharist, but I think it applies to all of these, is uh, we know God is everywhere, but we know God for sure will show up here, right? We can be guaranteed that God will show up in baptism, in the Eucharist, and all, right, in all of these things. We don't have to go looking. God's there, and we know it every time. And what a grace that is. What a grace that is. And so to end this study, which I've actually really enjoyed because this has been um, a way for me, actually, to explore each of these and contemplate each of these in a different way than I often do, to really think about how I do encounter God's grace in each of these and how each of these are signposts of God's kingdom for us. But I think the, the takeaway for me, right, if, if the, this class is about becoming a walking sacrament, an outward and visible sign of God's grace out in the world, and if the sacraments are not just places where we encounter God's grace, but they're actually invitations into a whole life filled and permeated with God's grace, then the challenge for us, if I'm going to leave us with one, I know I asked that question about, you know, how do we be a presence of healing out in the world, and that's a good thing to be, but I would go a step further and say the challenge for us in this whole class is then how do we invite people into this life? If we are invited into a grace-filled life, how do we invite others into that same life too? Isn't that what we're called to do? That's the mission of the church, right? To restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. And so I guess to end, the challenge would be an evangelistic one. How do we bear that good news and that grace out in our world, wherever we may be? Not just being maybe a kinder person, a, a, again, a presence of healing, a presence of peace, that's all good. But how do we also say to those around us, come join me here, <laughs> right? The water is good. <laughs> because the world needs that, right? The world needs more walking sacraments. The world needs more outward and visible signs of God's grace. And so as we bring this class to a, a conclusion and as we get ready to enter the season of Lent, I can think of no better season actually to contemplate how part of our repentance during this time as we head towards Holy Week, part of our turning back towards God can include inviting others in, inviting others into this grace-filled life where we meet God and find that grace fulfilled in our own lives. So with that, let us end in prayer, and then we'll go forth, because I've got to get ready for church. The Lord be with you. Yeah, you. Almighty and gracious God, I thank you so very much that you do make yourself known to us, as Acts says, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers, that you do give us these signs that remind us that you are not far off, but, but that you are very near us, that your kingdom is very near us. That your kingdom is something that we can touch and feel and taste and see. God, I pray that we would be nourished and sustained by this grace that we experience here. That we would encounter you in new and profound ways in our life of faith and worship. And that we would be courageous 
and inviting others in to experience that same grace-filled life that you have blessed us with and bestowed upon us. I pray that you would be with us, that you would give us all that we need, because we know that you do, that you would give us all that we need to be those outward and visible signs of your grace and your kingdom at work in the world. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. And now go forth in the name of Christ, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. I'm supposed to say thanks be to God as well, but I'll, I'll take it, yes. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much. It was a lot of fun. And next week uh, we will, um, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, next week we will begin a new study that I'm really excited about, and uh, more information will come out about that this week. And uh, it's be a little bit more discussion-based than this one. We'll have some table discussion and some questions, um, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's based on a book called Seculosity by a guy named David Zoll. Um, you don't need to have read the book to get stuff out of the class. Um, and in fact, I'm actually going to be rearranging a lot of the chapters in that book and doing it very differently than <laughs> he presents it in the book. But it's all about how we've taken all of these parts of our lives and turned them into religions. Uh, but religions without grace. And as we've just been talking about these past seven weeks, grace is pretty crucial. So uh, we'll be, anyway, we'll be talking about that as we journey through Lent together towards Easter. So, all right, see you all next week.